to our second installment this semester. Uh, Henrik uh, was a post was a student in Göttingen, and he came to the University of Pennsylvania with his advisor, Alini Catafori. Uh, he finished there, so we got to know him very well. He went and did a postdoc at MIT, and now he's at Williams College, and he's going to tell us about functional networks, and he knows a lot about them. So take it away. All right. Thank you, Randy. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak here at this workshop. Um, second time's the charm, I guess, because Randy had, had asked me already. Uh, I believe that was two years ago and it didn't work out. So I, I'm glad- You had to, a department retreat. You had to- That is correct, yes. Yeah. That is correct. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here this time and to be able to make it. Um, Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit today about some of the work that I've been doing recently and not so recently. Um, and it, it, is, it is all uh, connected to the, what I call the physics of functional networks. And what do, what, what do I mean by that, by function, functional networks? What I mean by that um, is essentially, um, I'm interested in all sorts of networks uh, from biology and from engineering, um, and also networks that are more kind of, that you kind of play with. Um, and I'm interested in the connection between form and function. Um, here are three examples, and these are conveniently the examples that I'll be talking about today. Um, one example is the Venetian network of plant leaves, <clears throat> um, with, uh, which has the function of uh, transporting um, nutrients and water throughout the leaf blade, but also the function to keep the leaf blade um, flat and rigid. Uh, second example here, this is um, a representation of the electrical power grid of the United States. And the electrical power grid uh, obviously has the function of uh, delivering electrical power to consumers, but also uh, the function to remain synchronized and remain stable, in particular, um, now that there's a lot of feed in from, uh, from renewable power sources. And final example is um, uh, this uh, is a, a balls and springs network, just more of an uh, sort of, in a way, a theoretical uh, abstract model for mechanical metamaterials. And these can be designed to have function as well. So I'm sort of, I'm interested in the, in the interconnection between sort of the, the form of these networks, the function of these networks and the function as encoded in the idea that all of these networks are optimized for something. The idea that there's a function uh, is oftentimes connected to the fact that these networks uh, have, are, are optimized for something. They're particularly good at something. Okay, so today's talk is going to go through a bunch of examples and uh, uh, I hope uh, that it, it will be, uh, well, it will be a bit of a grab bag, but I hope that in the end, you will see the overarching theme behind all of these things. Okay, let's start with the, fine, with the last example that I gave, and that's uh, mechanical networks. And in particular, this is, this is a project that I did while I was a postdoc at MIT. And together with my advisor, uh, Jörn Dunkel there, we were interested in mechanical networks that, um, that have um, uh, band gaps. Uh, what is a band gap? Well, it is a region in the harmonic, um, uh, in, the, in the sort of in the spectrum of harmonic modes of, of such a material, of, of vibrational modes of such a material where there are no modes. Um, and such a, a band gap, for example, can be found in various systems, for instance, um, in this beautiful sculpture that is located somewhere in Madrid. Um, it has an, a band gap apparently in the acoustic spectrum. So you can stand on one side of this thing, um, say something. And if you say it at the right frequency, then a listener at the other end will not be able to hear it because, well, there are no modes to uh, transmit, the, transmit the waves, the acoustic waves. And there has been some uh, beautiful work uh, on um, other gyroscopic metamaterials um, and finally, there's uh, more general work on um, uh, sort, of, sort of mechanical metamaterials. And so um, 
Bjorn and I, we were talking and we were thinking, and um, we, we came up to this idea that, well, there should be a way to um, optimally, des optimally design uh, mechanical networks, these balls and springs networks to have such a band gap. Turns out that that is in a way that that's a it's an important problem and that a lot of a lot of engineers work on this problem, but we decided to attack it from a slightly different perspective. And the perspective that we decided to attack it from was um, well from the from sort of a physics perspective. Okay, and to attack it from a physics perspective, we need to know the physics of these mechanical networks, obviously. And here's the physics. Well, it is it's really just Newton's laws. Um, and we're looking at Newton's laws in uh, a linearized approximation. And this is just it, this mass times acceleration plus, and there's a matrix K here that's called the stiffness matrix. And the stiffness matrix uh, encodes all the, um, the relative position and the, uh, the geometry of the network. And most importantly, it encodes the, the relative stiffnesses or the stiffnesses of the springs in this balls and springs network. And so this is, uh, this is the dynamics uh, of, of such spring network, balls and springs networks. That's completely encoded in, in, this, uh, in this equation. Okay, so I mentioned that we wanted to design networks to have a band gap. And so the band gap is in the spectrum of the normal modes. You calculate the normal modes by, well, doing an eigen decomposition of the stiffness matrix. You know, you, you plug in a um, harmonic ansatz, you get this equation. It's an eigenvalue equation, and the eigenmodes um, then give you uh, the normal modes. And when there's a band gap, then this is what the spectrum roughly looks like. This is a bit of a cartoon. So we're uh, plotting um, the density of states, so the number of states at a given frequency against the frequency. And clearly, in this particular case, there is a gap. And that's what this band gap is. Okay, so there are a lot of approaches for uh, performing this band gap optimization. And the standard approach um, these days uses um, semi definite programming and it directly uh, maximizes the distance between two adjacent eigenvalues. Uh, we decided we potentially could do that, but we wanted to do something else. And instead, we decided to do to use physics, and we decided to say, well, instead of uh, maximizing the distance between the eigenvalues, let's uh, minimize the response at a certain, at a given frequency. That's something very physical, and something, well, uh, something where we can say, okay, here's our our mechanical network. We're um, shooting sound at it at a given frequency. We record the responses of the response curves of, of all the uh, displacements of all the nodes uh, in the network. And then we average that over time. And we average that over all the different um, possibilities of shooting sound at the network. We end up with a very nice uh, optimization functional that's differentiable. It has all the, all the nice properties that you can, that you can uh, wish for. Um, and, uh, this is, uh, this is the idea that, well, let's look at this response curve and let's fix uh, one frequency here and let's minimize the response at that frequency. And it turns out that this uh, approach works uh, surprisingly well. Um, here is a, a movie showing sort of an iterative procedure where here is a, on the left-hand side, what you see is, um, is an initial network. And here I chose, uh, this is a, um, a periodic network. This is one unit cell of a periodic network. These are balls and springs in two dimensions. Um, the positions are, are randomized um, and the thickness of each connection between two nodes corresponds to the stiffness of the spring. And on the right-hand side, you see um, a band spectrum of this, um, if you, many of you uh, can probably read a band spectrum and that's fine, but if you can't read a band spectrum, then just focus on the density of states that is uh, next to it. Uh, and that will show how, that, how this gap opens. So I'm gonna just run 
uh, this optimization procedure that we came up with. Whoops. Uh, let me try that again. Now I will run the optimization procedure. And as you can see, more and more iterations and the span gap, this gap in the spectrum uh, opens up more and more. And at the same time, um, what you see is that on the left-hand side, our stiffnesses, the distribution of our stiffnesses essentially becomes bimodal. Um, I've, uh, I've actually, um, what I did here was I added in a constraint and allowed only stiffnesses with a minimum stiffness of 0 0.1 in this, in these sort of dimensionless units, and maximum stiffness of one. And these stiffnesses uh, sort of arrange at, at these bounds. There are a couple that, that are kind of in between, but most of them arrange at the bounds of the, of the allowed uh, stiffnesses. And they arrange in these very interesting, um, in, this, in, this, in this very interesting pattern that, um, for, for a long time, we tried to understand, but we couldn't really make, make a lot of sense of the pattern that we got. Depending on where you put your optimization, the pattern changes. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in general, it's, uh, yeah, it, it looks quite beautiful, but it's also quite mystifying. Okay, so um, this is uh, simple band gap optimization. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, that's a big field. People essentially know how to do that. It's not, it's cool that we can do it, but it's not that cool. So we decided to do a slight, to attack a slightly harder problem. And um, we asked ourselves, well, maybe we can switch the gap on and off. And how do you switch a gap on and off in a mechanical system? You need some sort of switch. And the switch that we decided to look at theoretically um, was a global deformation. So shear transformations or compression transformations. So we set up, take our material and we squish it together. And when we squish it together, that opens up a band gap. Sort of the, the big hope was back then my office was uh, right on the, uh, right on, on Massachusetts Avenue, uh, not Massachusetts Avenue, right, right facing Memorial Drive in Cambridge. And um, it gets loud. And it was my, my dream was sort of to have a material um, that I could just, I could just uh, push on my window and just uh, shut, shut off all the sound on the outside. Well, I think that's going to stay a dream for a while, but this is what we have. Um, so we were able to come up with an objective function that sort of turns this problem into a multi-objective optimization. Um, we scalarize that and then um, we essentially, uh, or rather I, I, um, I ran sort of a Monte Carlo search over various um, combinations of, of, uh, imp, uh, of various combinations between the trade-off, sort of having the, the gap open at one uh, strain and closed at a different strain. And this is what we get, sort of the best uh, result out of all of them. Here, I'm, uh, I'm shearing this network. And as I'm shearing the network, uh, the gap opens. And while, when it's unsheared, the gap is it's closed. I'm just gonna show this video again. Unsheared gap is open here on the left and in blue and the sheared network, the gap, um, the gap opens. You can do this with other um, transformations as well. So this is a compression transformation and uh, this network was designed in such a way that when it compresses, the band gap opens. Let me show that again. Same idea on the left is the uncompressed network. On the right is the compressed network. And down here are the densities of state of states. And you see that you can compress this network um, and open the gap. And again, we get these, these networks that show sort of really fascinating looking um, uh, sort of weighted topology uh, that again, appears quite mystifying. Uh, to, to really understand why this particular configuration has this property and, and no other it does. Okay, so we can do this um, together with um, a student, um, Josephine 
uh, who did a Europe, so an undergrad researcher at MIT, we designed and numerically simulated um, sort of um, in finite element simulations uh, uh, realizations of these networks. And we found that in these uh, two networks, we could also open these band gaps, at least in simulations. For a while, we also tried to do experiments here, but it turned out that that is very difficult. And uh, we were then happy that uh, we could at least do it in, uh, with finite elements. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the um, of this mechanical part of the talk, and let me continue with the second system that I'm interested in, um, and this is um, uh, vascular networks, and in particular the vascular network in plant leaves. And this is a lot of what this kind of is a topic that has been. Uh, with me for my entire scientific career almost. And I started this as a PhD student with Eleni, who I believe is uh, in the audience. And if you watched Eleni's prize talk yesterday, you will recognize some of this. Um, um, okay, so the idea here is uh, that we're looking at plant leaves. And here's, a, here's an example uh, of a plant leaf. And plant leaves over the course of evolution have been, um, have sort of evolved these highly uh, complex and highly uh, hierarchically organized networks. And the function of this network essentially is to, um, is to perfuse the, um, the leaf blade with water and to transport nutrients that are produced uh, uh, using photosynthesis uh, uh, back out of the leaf. Okay. So uh, it turns out that there's been a lot of work on the optimization uh, of, of, such, um, of such networks, of, such, of these leaf networks. And it turns out that they're believed to be optimized um, for efficient transport, uh, well, for efficient transport of water um, under constraints that model um, uh, sort of under, under kind of a, um, resilience under an additional requirement to be resilient against uh, fluctuating loads and resilient against damage or resilient against damage, I should say. But there's a, a curious thing about these networks and that is in, uh, in the way that they grow. So these are some, um, some, uh, some images taken um, from a paper from 2004 where these, where these people um, analyzed um, um, a growing leaf in a plant called Arabidopsis. And as you say, as you can see here, um, the, the venation network grows along with the leaf and it becomes more complex along with the leaf. And so a question that we were asking back then was, can we somehow, um, can we somehow understand the complexity of this network and the hierarchical organization of this network as a consequence of, um, of growth and uh, of growth of the underlying, of the underlying um, leaf blade and an adaptive process uh, that goes on in these, uh, in a, a sort of an adaptive morphogenetic process that goes on uh, in these leaf blades. And it turns out, turns out that, that that is something we can do. And so the idea here is that, um, and this is a model that, that, that's been relatively well established, um, is that there's an adaptive law underlying uh, the growth of these networks. And we can, um, it's essentially a use it or lose it rule. And the use it or lose it rule tells us that there's a differential equation governing the growth of, uh, of each vessel's conductivity, which is related to its size. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a positive feedback term that con uh, uh, contains the, the flow through the vessel. There's a negative feedback term um, that essentially says if there's no flow through the vessel, then um, the, the, vessel, um, the vessel just exponentially decays. And finally, we came up with this term that models the effects of growth. It's sort of, a, it's sort of an effective term where the, sort of the, the actual growth of the leaf blade has been integrated out and all the effective, uh, uh, all the effective uh, effects of growth are kind of, are sort of, uh, uh, combined in this term. And this term contains essentially a time scale over which this growth happens. 
And the interesting thing is if you now run this, then um, it leads to a dynamics where the main veins generate first, then second order veins generate, then third order veins generate and so on. And you end up um, with a topology or weighted topology of the network um, that, that reproduces sort of this hierarchical structure where we have main veins, second order veins, third order veins, and so on. You may have noticed that um, uh, this network that I'm showing here uh, does not contain all of these interesting loops and, and interconnections that I showed in the real leaf network. And um, the reason is that you can't get these loops from, from this particular model. This particular model can be mathematically proven to always generate topological trees or topological tree graphs you have to add in some more information. And the additional information you can add in is the fact that um, there are fluctuations going on uh, during development. Fluctuations um, that are fluctu essentially fluctuations in the flows of the morphogens uh, on the leaf plate. If you add this in and you think about, and you say to yourself, well, this is probably, um, What's going on here is probably that the fluctuations happen on a time scale that is much, much shorter than a time scale of the adaptation. Then we're kind of, we're, maybe we're allowed to average over the fluctuations. Well, we can do that. We can add in these, um, this average over the fluctuations instead of the fluctuations themselves here. We can run the model on a graph and we find that now we can actually reproduce um, loops in this network. So this network that I'm, this optimized network that I'm showing here does show loops in particular loops connecting um, the, the, the major vessels. Okay, so now we do have a way of, kind of, of modeling networks that have loops, um, but we can play a lot with these, with the parameters of the model. Um, this, this, uh, Time scale, this time scale of growth and uh, this little kappa here is kind of a scale um, telling us what the what the sort of what a certain morphogen concentration at the beginning of the optimization is. And uh, we can play with these and we can think it to ourselves, well, what combination would nature choose? And um, one way of deciding which combination of parameters nature might choose is uh, to think about the function again. And the function that these, plate, these, these plant leaves have is, is manifold actually. Um, so what we essentially came up with are, is a, a functional space of, of three requirements. One requirement is that it be robust. So if I that means if I remove an edge, if I cut, snip off an edge, the network should still work. A tree graph will not, will not do that. If you cut a tree graph, then it will, it will get disconnected. So, those are out of the question. Um, next, it should be cheap. And that can be modeled with uh, a, a cost that essentially uh, takes into account the, uh, something like the total volume of the network, which appears like a reasonable, uh, reasonable thing that, uh, that the sort of a plant might invest. So it's sort of like number of cells that are used to build the network. And finally, there's, there's a third dimension to this, which is robustness against damage, uh, sorry, which is, um, what did I say, fragility, cost, and oh, um, um, hydraulic efficiency. So the other, uh, the, the third dimension is hydraulic efficiency. So um, efficient um, transport of, 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 of uh, uh, fluids. And so then you can think of yourself, well, um, there's a region there that uh, contains the region of optimal trade-offs between all of these uh, requirements, and that's the Pareto front. And um, we can analyze this region of optimal trade-offs, and we can find sort of a continuum of can find a continuum of phenotypes, network uh, phenotypes between a phenotype that is that is uh, on the left here that is highly reticulate. Um, so that's very, very robust, not very, fra not fragile, but it's kind of expensive. And that may be something that is in this, uh, that is realized in this real leaf that I'm showing up here. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a leaf that is, um, that is uh, um, very efficient, um, but 
not as robust. And um, that might be realized in the kind of leaf architecture that I'm, that I'm showing on top here. But again, but here we, we, we again kind of get a whole spectrum, a whole um, phenotypic space of these, uh, of these Venetian networks. And um, there are some that nature appears to, uh, that, that nature might, uh, um, might prefer according to, the, to, this, um, to this Pareto analysis and others that nature might not prefer. And those are the ones that are not Pareto. Okay, so we've been talking, or I've been talking um, a lot about the vascular properties of these plant leaves in terms of, of fluid flow and requirements from that. But it turns out that there's another requirement that these plant leaves um, uh, that these plant leaves fulfill, and that is the the requirement of being mechanically rigid. Um, as you can see on the on the right here, um, this leaf uh, is kind of it just kind of hangs there, right? And it's it's flat, and that is also something that the Venetian network is responsible for, this mechanical rigidity. So there's a second um, kind of kind of function there. And um, one might ask themselves, uh, what could optimization for mechanical rigidity give us? Will it give us, give, will it give us similar network, networks? Will it give us very different networks? That was a question that I asked myself uh, uh, quite recently. And um, so before we, can, before we can answer this question, um, well, there is the question, is this optimization too? Um, before, we before I can answer this question, um, uh, we, we, we have to think about what are the forces and the loads uh, on such a leaf. And it turns out that the forces, the main force is, is gravity. Well, that, there might also be wind, but uh, let's imagine that it's a, it's a not so windy day. Um, when I thought about that, I was in Cambridge, which tends to be a windy place. So maybe the, the trees in Cambridge actually want to minimize for optimized for wind. Um, but in general, let's, uh, let's think of gravity as the, dominating, uh, as the dominating load on these leaves. Um, so so you, um, you go through the, through the engineering literature and the engineers have actually come up with a way of, of, of quantifying how rigid um, a mechanical system is. And what they have come up with is uh, a quantity called the compliance. And the compliance is really nothing but uh, the dot product between the applied load and the displacement due to that load. And um, now you can think a little bit and you think, well, maybe I want to minimize this compliance. And uh, once you've thought about it for a few minutes, you come to the conclusion that that's not a well-posed problem um, because, well, uh, how do I make my displacement, how do I minimize my displacement at a, at a fixed load? Well what happens is I can just uh, increase all my stiffnesses and make them infinite. That's precisely what happens. So this is not a well-posed problem yet. We can make it well-posed um, by adding in a constraint. As I mentioned before, um, sort, of the, the, sort of the idea behind, fluid flow, but behind this fluid flow optimization was that there's a constraint as well. There is some sort of amount of cost, some sort of, um, material investment that the plant can invest in its, in its, uh, in its venation network. And here uh, I'm going to, to use a, a very similar, um, in fact, the exact same idea uh, that there's a total cost that might be the volume, the total volume of the network that might be the total mass of the network that might be cross-sectional area of the network or anything in between. Um, so some, some geometric constraint. And if you fix this uh, to some constant number, then you can actually do this optimization. Um, it becomes a non-convex optimization problem. So you expect a lot of uh, local minima. And for this reason, I use a simulated annealing procedure here. And uh, I'm just gonna uh, run this. Uh, and this uh, goes through sort of, this is kind of the simulated annealing. It just, it relaxes for a few iterations and then it thermalizes. And this way it starts trying to explore um, uh, the energy landscape of these, of these constrained uh, networks. And what it seems to find very quite reliably is sort of this, this main vein 
But to get the higher order structure in these networks, um, it takes a bit of time. Um, as you can see, it, the compliance does decrease pretty significantly as we do this. And finally, whoops, finally, it does kind of, it does converge to something that, that kind of resembles uh, relief venation. And in particular, it has the main vein structure, it has the second order vein structure, but what it has, uh, what it also has is the um, anastomoses or the redundant interconnections between the second order veins. And this you can get from the mechanical optimization without any additional uh, requirements. This just comes out. It just automatically comes out of this mechanical optimization. You don't have to, you don't need to postulate um, resistance to like fluctuations or damage or anything like that. It's just a part of the mechanical model, which might be uh, in, in the sense of Occam's razor might be a good thing when we think about modeling. Okay, let's look at a, a couple of results here. Um, so I'm, I'm varying the parameters of this model a little bit. This gamma parameter tells you what precisely the constraint is that you're thinking about, whether it's kind of, whether it's um, uh, cross-sectional area or mass or something in between. Uh, this is a sort of a yeah, geometric constraint. Down, uh, down below here, what you see is that uh, I changed the, the boundary conditions a little bit. And this is more like a lily pad and less like sort of a, a leaf that just hangs there. Um, but the, 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 gener the generic features of these optimized networks are all roughly the same. Um, and uh, when we measure the compliance, um, actually, then we can find that the compliance is, is actually improved by a factor of about 20 to 60 uh, with respect to a uniform network. We can compare that to, um, uh, to fluid flow optimization where, gener where generally you don't get such a, such a marked uh, improvement in compliance as uh, in, in the fluid optimal, uh, optimization function. For fluids, you generally look at the power dissipation and you tend to get an improvement on the order of 10%. In, in this in the viscous power dissipation. So here the improvement in compliance is really, really quite significant. Um, and you can also see that when you make some, uh, some 3D printed versions of this. So here I 3D printed a um, um, sort of a, a hexagonal grid and the upper 3D printed hexagonal uh, grid has the same volume as the lower one, uh, but the upper one was optimized and the lower one was not. And as you can see, the upper one, when I fix it uh, like this, it essentially is it's, it's just exactly flat, whereas the lower one kind of droops down a little bit. And if you measure this, then, well, I couldn't actually measure this, the, this the, say something that, like the tip displacement was immeasurably small, at least for me, but the tip displacement for uh, the, the uniform network is in this case on the order of four centimeters. And they're about 15 centimeters in size, something like that about this. I wish I could show you the model, but I don't have it here right now. Um, if you're interested, I, uh, I can send videos uh, of these uh, 3D printed models. Okay, so, so in particular for these leaf networks, we've kind of seen now that um, there are various um, uh, various ways of thinking about optimization and thinking about function. Um, let me see, how much time do I have left? Lots. Lots, okay, wonderful. Then um, I can go to another type of network now. So, so the, this example was uh, sort of optimization of leaf networks. Um, the very beginning I was, I, I talked about optimization and design of these uh, band gap metamaterials. And another interest of mine um, are power grids. Um, this is also uh, a, a project that I, I was thinking about while I was at MIT together with uh, Jan Dunkel and with Michael Wilczek from, from Göttingen. And so here um, we were thinking about the following, the following problem. Um, this is an example, or this is a, a, a sort of a, um, 
visualization of the high, high voltage transmission grid of the United States. And a high voltage transmission grid, uh, you can see all these different colors and they all mean different types of lines. And it's kind of interesting, um, interesting just from a historical perspective, how these things uh, were built. In the US, you have kind of three different, uh, three different grids that are more or less disconnected from each other. We have an, a grid on the Eastern seaboard. We have a grid uh, in the West, sort of started, started from California. And then there's Texas. And Texas just does its own thing. Um, and all of these grids are, are they're desynchronized and uh, well, mostly desynchronized and um, Essentially, the US has three different power grids. Um, so then we were thinking, well, there's, there's, this, uh, there's this problem about power grids. And that problem is, uh, for the longest time, we have been using um, fossil energy um, or nu and nuclear energy, like coal, nuclear, um, gas turbines, all of that stuff. And all of these have the advantage that they are very steady. So you can set your coal power plant to, I don't know, uh, 100 megawatts and uh, it'll produce 100 megawatts and, and that's it, as long as you supply it with enough coal. But there's, there's increasingly a push uh, uh, to get away from that and get away from say coal, from coal nuclear and things like that. And instead there's a push kind of to, um, uh, to, to um, supply the grid with renewable energy sources, renewable energy sources such as wind power or solar power. And these, are, these have a quite a different um, behavior in terms of their power output. They're much more erratic. Uh, there's much more fluctuation, much more noise in these. Um, so, uh, and, and they, they really, they require um, a different grid in a way to deal with this, to deal with this, with these fluctuations. Um, so essentially we were, we were asking ourselves, well, how can we design a resilient network, a network that really sort of optimizes for um, this, all this, all this noise that reduces noise, that minimizes noise, that is noise canceling, if you will. So we were interested in a noise canceling network. Um, and the way we thought about this is, is as follows. Well, um, oh, well, this is, this is sort of, this is an example of output from a wind farm, one particular wind farm. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite erratic. Um, yeah, so the way that we thought about this question is uh, as follows. There's, a, there's a, a standard model for AC power grids, so alternating current power grids. Um, each node of a, power, of a power grid, that's either a generator, um, say a power plant, or uh, a consumer, or sort of an aggregate of consumers, is modeled as a synchronous motor. And you, I, I have the pleasure of teaching uh, first year ENM uh, this semester, and so, um, uh, I'll be talking a lot about uh, the magnetic flux through a loop. And the magnetic flux through a loop um, is, uh, is exactly what, what generates power in a power plant. Um, you, you, start, uh, you have a rotating mass. The rotating mass is essentially a magnet. Um, the magnet, uh, well, okay, so this is highly simplified, but the magnet rotates in a, a, in a wire loop and that generates uh, an alternating current. But it also works the other way around. Uh, when you have an alternating current through a wire loop and you put a magnet in there, then there will be a torque on that magnet. So um, electrical motors and, and generators are the same thing. And so we model them as the same thing effectively. And so uh, when, we, when we then connect them as a network, then uh, we, we essentially do the, sa the same thing as when we, do, uh, as we, when we not model AC, uh, uh, AC circuits. We assume that there's some that, that we can describe the uh, power by a phase and an amplitude, um, and uh, we can connect all this. <clears throat> and there is a, a an equation called the swing equation that encapsulates all this information at the lowest level. 
um, it has a second order. It's an equation for the phase, for the phase angle um, of my AC power at each node. And it can, uh, contains a term that comes from inertia of my rotating mass. Uh, it has a term that comes from friction, also of my rotating mass. And it has a term that um, couples oscillators at different nodes. And um, the coupling constants, these BJKs, um, are called um, the line susceptances. Um, and they're, they're essentially related to some physical property of the power lines. Uh, and this, that's, that's the equation that, that I'm going to use. And this equation, um, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Kuramoto model, you'll Im immediately see this is essentially a Kuramoto model uh, with inertia. And so these equations have a, a surprising range of application and they can model things as, uh, um, as different as um, firing neurons, um, uh, coupled uh, chemical reactions, um, or even the, the synchronization properties of, of fireflies. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that there's also this P term, which is, excuse me, which is the net um, power input at each node, which will be relevant shortly. Okay, so beyond power grids, um, beyond power grids, this swing equation has, um, has a lot of applications. All right, so let's circle back and think about what we want to do. We want to take a, a network that is described with dynamics, where the dynamics are described by the swing equation. And we want to input some fluctuating power. And we want the result of that to be minimized. We don't want, us, uh, we don't want noise in that network. We want to minimize noise. OK, so how do we think about that? Here's one way to think about it. Um, we're thinking of the input power as uh, 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 decomposed into a mean input and fluctuations about the mean. And the mean input might just be the average power output that comes from this wind farm that I'm showing on the right here. And the fluctuations essentially come from, well, the fluctuations about the mean. So this is what that might look like um, in the output. So if I input um, noise with mean and fluctuations about the mean into my network, then my output will look the same way. My output will have some mean output plus some fluctuating component on top of that. And um, now I will do the thing that physicists love to do and I will expand about uh, the, the average and I will assume that my fluctuations are small. And when I do this, um, Oops. Okay, sorry. This this slide first. Okay, here's a, just an, an example of the different um, of the different inputs that I can ask for. Um, this is like this is uh, think of this as completely random noise, random white noise in space and in time, and um, a different kind of noise over here that is correlated in space and time. It's also noisy. But this is uh, sort of this is an Einstein Uhlenbeck process in time, and it's uh, uh, correlated in space as well. Why am I interested in these different types of noise? I'm interested in these different types of noise because, uh, well, where does our noise really come from? It comes from the weather. Um, say some some passes over a solar farm or some. Um, uh, there's like wind gusts uh, that um, that hit some 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 wind farm, so it might be relevant, or it's probably relevant to think about um, think about correlated inputs. Okay, and with this cor with these correlated inputs, um, you can write you can um, write down uh, in a linearized model an exact um, an exact objective function uh, that encapsulates the idea that I want to minimize the average, um, I have a pointer, the average uh, noise. So this is sort of the, the noise variance averaged over time and averaged over all the nodes. 
uh, that should be an I here. I'm just noticing that. That should be an I. Um, so you can find an, an expression for that and you can explicitly write down a minimization problem for this expression. And again, you have to add in um, a constraint. Um, and this time the constraint is really it, it, the same, really the same idea as with the leaves. You have to have a constraint that sort of encapsulates the fact that there is a finite amount of resources that you have available to, to build your network. And when you do this, then this is what you get. Um, these are some, some results of these optimizations and I'm sort of, I'm plotting sort of in the background, um, the noise that I'm uh, feeding in. And on top of that, I'm putting the optimal network that it found. Again, this is a, a non-convex problem, so it'll find lots of local minima. And this time I uh, didn't go, um, go through the hassle of, of globally minimizing this. These are all local minima. Um, and what you see is quite interesting that um, on the left, on the left here, um, I have in, I'm, I'm looking at input correlations that are well uncorrelated. So this is essentially white noise. And um, when we get, when we see that, when we look at that, then we see that for white noise, we get a little bit of hierarchical organization in the network and a lot of uh, a lot of loops. So this is this is a highly um, highly loopy, highly redundant network. Um, increasing the correlation scale more and more, um, the networks become more and more hierarchically organized and less reticular, less redundant. Um, there are fewer loops, and um, the, the the network is essentially uh, goes from from much larger thicknesses to much smaller thicknesses than than in the in the white noise case. And we kind of rationalize that as well. In the white noise case, you never know what you're going to get, so you have to uh, you have to be extremely redundant. You have to be prepared for anything. So there's a lot of redundancy in the network. Whereas um, when there's a lot of correlation in the input um, in the in the input fluctuations, then you do basically know what you're going to get, and um, you can get away with investing less in redundancy. And you can invest more in uh, in hierarchy, and this hierarchy is sort of what sort of optimizes power flow of, or, or efficiency in the flow. Okay, you can also look at these optimized networks, and you can think to yourselves, "Hmm, that looks very much like what he showed earlier in this talk." And it does. Um, it does seem to resemble quite quite nicely um, a lot of these biological systems. For instance, the leaf that I that I've been talking about. Uh, in terms of, well, the, the boundary conditions are different, obviously, but still you can see that there is sort of a, a, a hierarchical backbone to these uh, to these optimal oscillator networks, optimal power grids. Um, and, and a sort of a hierarchy and uh, anastomoses, interconnections and redundancy. And we see similar types of architectures in, in other systems, such as slime molds. This is the, the famous slime mold, Physarum polycephalum, that is able to solve mazes, um, or even here in the, in the um, blood vessel network of the, I'm pretty sure this is a mouse retina, not a human retina. But a human retinas are very similar. And all of these biological uh, networks appear to uh, follow very similar similar principles, and the principles are also similar um, to these uh, uh, to these engineered networks. Okay, so um, having talked about that, the next question one one might ask is: uh, Can we quantify this stuff? Um, can we think about well, how do we take networks and how can we can we tell what it actually is can we tell whether say the leaf network is optimized for fluid flow or optimized for uh, mechanical stability or is it something completely different and um, there are different ways of kind of, of, of approaching this question um, so one way um, oops <laughs> there are ways of approaching this uh, in fact i forgot that i had something else here that i also wanted to share um, 
before I talk about quantification, um, um, here's, a, here's a slightly a, a different question. That's also something that is, that is uh, uh, very recent. Uh, it's sort of an, an aside I, I, always want, I almost want to say, and that is the question of, when we look at these optimal networks, where do the loops even come from? And what is really the mechanism of loop formation? Um, this is a question that uh, I thought about with uh, uh, Dirk Without from, from Forschungszentrum Jülich and, and his student Franz Kaiser. And um, so uh, this is really, this is really Franz's work. Uh, I, I contributed very little to this, but it's still, uh, it's, it's still quite fascinating. Um, so uh, we thought about, um, we want, to, we want to really know what the mechanism is with which these loops uh, are generated. And we essentially did that by looking at a model flow network that is so simple that, we, that the optimization problem can be solved analytically. And we can, do, we can find this analytically. And uh, Franz did this, and I did this for a slightly different class of networks, but the results are always the same. Um, when you do this analytically, you find that uh, loopy minima, as you, as you move through, the, through parameter space, as you change your parameters, loopy minima appear as saddle node bifurcations. Um, in this in the space of opt, uh, in the space of optimal networks, they appear as saddle node bifurcations. But um, the global optimum, uh, which we can also for this case we can calculate that analytically, uh, the global optimum um, switches discontinuously. So there's a discontinuous transition in the global optimum between um, uh, from from as you as you change this cost parameter. Um, as you increase this cost parameter on the left here, the global optimum is a, is a, a topological tree. Then at some value of the cost parameter, uh, a new optimum bifurcates as a saddle node bifurcation. And then there's a, a certain uh, critical point where the global optimum switches and jumps discontinuously in the, uh, in the parameters of the model uh, to a different global optimum. And what Franz was also able to do is he rigorous, he was able to rigorously prove that the tree all, always remains a uh, KKT point. So a Karush Kuhn Tucker uh, point that, that satisfies the, the, the KKT necessary conditions for being an optimum. So the tree never goes away. It's always there. And new loopy optima appear uh, out of the blue in a saddle node bifurcation. Um, what we then also thought, well, we, we can kind of solve this um, for this for this model network. Uh, can we learn something about networks? Can we learn something about bigger networks? Uh, can we learn where the first loop appears when we move when we change parameters? And in fact, we can. This is also something that Franz figured out is um, the there's a there's a predictor. If you once you move when you move the, your uh, through parameter space, there's a predictor for where the next loop will be. Um, uh, so you move through param parameter space, and you always try to find the next global minimum of your of your dissipation function. And um, you can predict the position where the, of where the next loop will appear by the um, average um, over the um, pressure drop between the nodes of the edge where the loop appears. And this works surprisingly well. So he, de he derived this uh, using a number of approximations, uh, but it, it does work. And it even works when it's not just the first loop that appears, it works for, for subsequent loops as well. So here's, um, here's a bigger network. Um, what, we're, what I'm showing here is the, the pressure drop or this average pre pressure drop between uh, veins uh, or, or between nodes that where there is no edge. Um, and then on the right-hand side here, uh, what, what Franz did was he took this uh, topological tree, he perturbed it a little bit, uh, increased the, uh, increased, uh, the parameter uh, in the model, uh, let it relax, let it find a global optimum. And it turns out that the order of appearance of where the next loop appears uh, is extremely well predicted. By this, uh, by this pressure drop, pressure drop criterion. So, um, 
that kind of tells us at least a little bit structurally um, that th this loop formation is kind of like a relax, it's, it's kind of like, like, like crack formation in that when you have a desiccating, desiccating mud, there's some stress in that. And the stress gets relieved by creating a crack. Uh, and here, this is a very similar idea. Um, there is some stress uh, in these networks and the stress gets relieved um, by creating a loop, a redundant interconnection in the network. All right, so that's our contribution to uh, the question of where will the next loop form? All right, so finally, uh, and I hope uh, <laughs> this is now actually where I am, where I'm at is the question of, um, we've seen all of these different networks and in particular, uh, in the case of the biological networks, uh, there's the question of, well, what is it? What is it, you know, is it, uh, uh, mechanical optimization? Is it um, fluid optimization? Is it something else? Uh, what do they actually optimize? And so there are, there are different ways of, of um, thinking about comparing these networks. And um, none of them are perfect. Um, in fact, they're, they're, they're significantly less than perfect. Um, but they're kind of they're, they're a start, um, and there's really a lot of a lot to think about uh, a lot to think about here, and a lot of difficulties uh, also, especially because the optimized networks that we can generate tend to be very small, just for computational reasons. This optimized network maybe has uh, something like 600 edges in it, and what I'm showing on the right here is a scan of a real leaf. Um, and, and um, a lot of these real leaves have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of edges. So that's uh, not feasible computationally, at least not right now to, to, to optimize uh, at that scale. But we can still kind of make qualitative uh, uh, steps forward, um, qualita qualitative progress. And so, um, this is uh, so this leaf. This is from data from essentially. This is uh, from data that I used in my PhD thesis uh, with Eleni and with uh, Jana Lasse, who is at, at Graz now, I believe, TU Graz. Um, and so uh, Jana did really a, a fantastic amount of work uh, taking digital images of these leaves and. Um, uh, turning them into into graphs that we can analyze, um, and um, it, it turns out that uh, in the in the in the leaf community, in the biology, in the in the leaf community uh, among biologists, um, they they like one particular topological measure that they can measure in this in these real leaves, and they call that the MST ratio, which is um, uh, essentially the length of all edges in the minimum spanning tree divided by the total length of all edges. And this is, appears to be something that we can calculate in this real leaves and also in say optimized leaves or optimized uh, yeah, leaf graphs. You have to do a little more than that. If you just calculate the MST ratio, then you don't get really a lot of information uh, because that is just, an, just, just one number. So instead, what people do is they calculate what's called a multi-scale MST ratio, where they prune all the edges up to some minimum radius R min. So they remove all of the smallest vessels from the network. They calculate the MST ratio. And then they increase R min, calculate the MST ratio again. And in doing so, you get a curve. And you get a curve that kind of characterizes um, the topology or the weighted topology of your network um, as you as you continue pruning. <clears throat> and so this is an analysis that um, um, that I did for these mechanically optimized networks. Um, and and here's what you get. So I took three different real leaves and I took 
more, more than three optimized networks, but I'm only showing three just be, so it doesn't get too crowded. Um, and I calculated these multi-scale MST ratios and you can see that obviously they're not the same. They're not even, I mean, numerically, <clears throat> That there's really no no hope at, at getting like a, a perfect numerical uh, correspondence here, but they kind of re recapitulate the same uh, the, the the same qualitative ideas about what these networks look like. And um, so, essentially, as you as you start increasing your pruning radius, at first you're pruning away all these smallest smallest the so-called freely ending veinlets your MST ratio doesn't change because you're pruning away a part of the minimum spanning tree. Um, then you're starting to prune away loops. So your MST ratio increases. Um, you're starting to prune away mostly these, these smaller loops. <clears throat> and finally, you start pruning away these larger vessels. And um, then you sort of get this, this, um, um, this, this characteristic jagged form of these curves that, that happen whenever you uh, cut away, when you remove one of the, uh, uh, one of the when, when you cut through one of the larger vessels or one of, uh, one of the larger, larger loops. So the, the optimized networks seem to recapitulate the structure of the real leaves, kind of. Uh, but it is really, uh, there's really no numerical or really or real quantitative way at least to my knowledge, uh, that allows me to say, okay, this, these are really the same or these are not the same. There's a, there's a different way that we try to, to quantify these networks. And uh, this is a little uh, older work um, that um, I, I did with Eleni during my PhD. And um, we thought of, um, or Eleni thought of a process called a hierarchical decomposition where, which is, this is a, it's a very similar idea to this MST ratio, but it uh, goes, uh, it, 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 it's, it's technically different. Um, the idea is again, that you um, uh, success, successively prune your network, um, but this time we're focusing on only the loops. So we'll, the first step in this hierarchical decomposition is to remove anything that's not part of a loop from our network. So we have a purely loopy network. Um, <clears throat> Um, so the, the, the um, um, yeah, so we have only loops. And then um, we kind of look at the dual graph of our network. So plant leaves are planar graphs to, I believe there's no known uh, counterexample to that in real plants. They are really planar. Um, and so what you do is um, you look at the dual graph and you assign to each facet of of your leaf graph, you assign a node in a tree. And you connect two nodes of that tree um, successively by, uh, by cutting um, intersect the, the smallest intersections. So, so you cut the smallest intersection between two loops first, you connect those two loops in a tree. And then you connect, you cut the next smallest intersection between two loops, say here, and you, con uh, you connect the two uh, uh, corresponding nodes uh, to a new node. And this new node um, corresponds to the new loop that you got by cutting away uh, the intersection. And this way you construct a binary tree that encapsulates sort of the hierarchical nesting structure of these loops. You can use this hierarchical nesting structure, this hierarchical tree, and you can extract a score from this tree that essentially tells you how, um, how nested these, uh, these, these, these trees are. And you can get some sort of a nesting score or a hierarchy score. Um, essentially you average, uh, for each node in that tree, you average the difference between the uh, leaf nodes at the at the left subtree minus the leaf nodes at the right subtree, then you divide by the uh, by the sum. That gives you a number, um, and then you, you, you average that over the entire tree. That gives you a score, and you can use this to score the hierarchical structure or the amount of hierarchy um, in such leaves. Um, 
and this is uh, some results that we did with this on the same data set where we, where we found various versions uh, of various degrees of hierarchy um, uh, in, in these uh, different um, in these different leaf networks. So that's a different way of trying to um, sort of quantify the structure of these of these networks. Um, but the point that I'd like to end on is that there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, these are kind of first steps uh, in, in really trying in trying to quantify uh, what's really going on in these networks and robustly quantify what's going on in these networks. Okay, and so I just want to show some of the examples again: uh, leaf networks, mechanical networks, and these these power grids. And kind of, I'd like to kind of end on the question, um, or kind of the, the out on an outlook. Um, what can we do next? Can we really find a way of, of sort of quantifying these better and connecting? Uh, can we kind of connect these uh, functional optimization problems to the uh, to the data to the data essentially? All right. Thank you for your uh, for your time and attention. So, are there any questions? Yeah, I, I have one. I really like the idea of thinning those veins and seeing what's left as you as you can you know use a thinning parameter. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the one thing with the tree on the end. Uh, was mm -hmm. doing that. I didn't quite pick up for sure, but I believe you were making the dual graph based on the, the width of the yes. edge it was crossing. Yes. But you could also just thin the edges and use your other ratio. I think it was MST ratio or something. Mm -hmm. But the notion of, of thinning it using that parameter and setting the hierarchical uh, structure as that parameter changes, I, I think that might be useful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely, and um, I believe I'm, I'm. I think I saw Eleni uh, in the audience. I believe that is something she once tried, if I remember correctly. So I, I may maybe I have tried, but I want to talk about work of other people actually that uh, followed up. Unfortunately, mm. I don't remember the the result. I don't, I don't remember the, the conclusion, but they mm. use this uh, variation of this hierarchical decomposition. Uh, uh, team, they applied it in big, like serious leaf people whose job is to measure leaves, mm -hmm. uh, and they did this. Your the method, Henrik, what you did uh, in the in the paper, and they did instead of um, uh, measuring the asymmetry, like using this tree and basically averaging the the asymmetry, they did other uh, things. They measured mm -hmm. other other things, so they did like a, a scale free. Uh, analysis at different levels of the leaf and they found some interesting conclusions that had to do with the leaf biology what is preserved what's not preserved and i don't remember them because they're also related on how you compare leaves so yeah. i'll uh, i'll send you the paper okay i yeah, don't remember thanks. the results which is the most interesting <laughs> but uh, they used to they used topology pre pretty seriously for uh, for leaves like plant biology group which was very nice to see that they followed up and they did all that work that uh, you di you didn't do in this paper. We di we we didn't get to do. Mm -hmm. Henrik, I, I have a question too, but I won't yeah. ask. I will wait other people. Okay. Henrik, what about baby leaves? You said that the that this leaf on the left is is too has you know hundred thousand too many nodes. Yeah. Baby leaves have so many nodes. Ah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, is the density of nodes? Um, is the density fixed or is the number of nodes fixed? Like, you know, I think about. Um, I think the density is fixed, uh, but so but they, if we, if we go back, baby, so baby leaves must have fewer nodes. Yes, they 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 do, um, or do they? Actually, that's a good question. I think it might be it might be. Um, hmm. So day day four here definitely has fewer nodes than day six. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 um, can't you compare more directly with baby leaves? I know yes. Seems... If, if I had the data for baby leaves, I think I could do that. Um, but that's just, that's just a matter of will because that, a microscope true. can see all the veins too, right? That is true. It is, it is a matter of will. In fact, we're, I'm actually thinking right now about, or we're thinking about a project where we go to Hopkins Forest here and we collect some leaves. And maybe we should focus on very small ones this time. Right, on shoots, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Yep. I have a, oh, thanks so much. I enjoyed your talk. Can you hear me? I just have a yes. follow up. Yeah, Quick I can follow hear up, you. Follow up to actually both points. Mm -hmm. um, I get, did you call it the MST parameter? Yes. Um, I, I think it, you know, part of the, what is happening between whether it's baby, adult, or any, anything in between is there is essentially multiple optimizations that are going on concurrently. Mm -hmm. So it isn't as if you, the leaf grows to the size that it can be sustained, mm -hmm. meaning physically sustained. So the veins will, will, would not overwhelm the size of the leaf or the other way around. And it just seems that there is the reason, for example, exactly, you, this graph is qualitatively similar, but not, but is not because on in a real leaf, you optimize for at least the two things you presented, mm -hmm. the hydrodynamics or the vascular network, the yes. fluid uh, dissipation and the physical stabilization of the substrate that this mm -hmm. is happening on. <clears throat> I, I'm just thinking like that, and can you comment whether that's in the right direction? That there is probably more the space of optimization is quite mm -hmm. large. Yeah, yeah, I I, I totally agree. I, I totally agree that there's there's really more to it than just fluid, fl either fluid flow or uh, mechanical right. stabilization. Uh, there, there there's really uh, probably some combination of those things and maybe other things as well. Um, and and we, can, we also can't forget that in these biological systems, there's all, always a number of just developmental constraints that, that they underlie where things just kind of have to develop in a certain way because that's how the biochemistry works. Absolutely. And, and connecting it to that is also, it's a hard problem. Well. You're ready for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. In that uh, band gap stuff you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. is there some kind of uh, topological signature in terms of why some frequencies get blocked? I mean, like it seems like there must be something like that, right? Connecting yeah. the uh, work by Jason Rocks on. Uh, yeah. Uh, that that's a that's a really good question. Um, there might be. Uh, I, I simply haven't tried. Uh, okay. I, I haven't I haven't tried, but I agree that that's definitely something to to look at. Yeah, because these look like some kind of filtration on the complexes of defined by these networks. I don't know. Uh, hmm. You, I, I would probably have to look up what that means. <laughs> Yeah, great talk. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask something? Uh, very interesting talk, especially the last part about these pruning edges. It's beautiful and interesting. Uh, however, I did not understand your mechanical model. This uh, this thing that you 3D printed. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that this uh, with this model you are shooting yourself in the foot because optimization that you showed there has nothing or seems to have nothing to do with all these subtle topological issues that are currently on the screen. But simply the rule is if you want to, to stabilize your leaf, don't put too much weight on this side and mm -hmm. put more thickness or rigidity on this side. That's the rule. Yep. There is nothing yeah. deep about. Yes, that, so that's that's. What, what, I, I I absolutely agree. I, I agree with that. Um, these these three D printed networks um, seem a little simpler, and that's simply and that's because the stiffness of material that you can get for three D printing uh, there's, there's a lower bound to that. So there's 
um, or rather an yeah a lower bound so you you can't get very uh you can't get a material to 3d print that is as soft as as a leaf um if you go back if you go back to the uh, to the real leaves then um uh what you have to compare that with is essentially uh something where the leaf lamina itself is, is very stiff already or where the where the where the material is, is extreme is very stiff already so you are saying that real leaves are optimized in some more subtle way than your mechanical model um then your 3d printed model I should say. then my then my 3d printed model yes i see okay so because i i was confused but otherwise it was very beautiful thank you thanks but there's something simple you can do uh, perhaps since you are having students uh, going in the forest you can look at leaves of different aspect ratios uh, and you can have leaves of relatively different aspect ratios the same plant and you can count the number of secondaries and i think your mm -hmm. model would give you different numbers of secondaries mm -hmm. let's forget about the higher order veins because you ne then uh, the fact that you have uh, the uh, leaf lamina with different stiffnesses might affect you but uh, you might have a signal that and it's easy to measure and it will be easy for students to measure mm -hmm. Elini, uh, yeah. why why only students should go to the forest in Italian uh, leaves <laughs> faculty members should do it too Okay. So I will. I will go to the forest myself because it's pleasant. Just right now, right now I can't. It's there are no leaves in the forest. Sure, right because now. because it's pleasant and uh, it's Indeed. the students who get to do the pleasant things, not the faculty who have to be in the office all day grading and whatnot. So we 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 run twenty minutes over. Are there any other questions from people who won't talk to Henrik again very soon? I have a question, but I hope I will talk to Henrik uh, soon. Can I ask okay. it? Well, why, why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we just <laughs> think we could stay on? Josh, you could stop recording, right? Or also.